People study the Bible together. They sing the songs together. They pray together. They work out together. Well, okay, not every church works out together. But Next Level Church in New Orleans is not just any church. And the missionary here, Bobby Williams, is not just any missionary. Before I got into ministry, um, first I started off working as a personal trainer. And from there I went on to coach track and field and cross country at a local college. Now that I'm in the pastoral role, I see the need uh, for a pastor to do more than just preach, more than just teach, but to help meet needs. In other words, Bobby Williams is the kind of guy who sees a problem and then wants to fix it. That's why he and his wife, Lakeisha, started Next Level Church in New Orleans East, because this is a neighborhood with lots of problems. It's very high crime area. So you have a lot of kids actually growing up in this community. For me, it reminds me of one of the reasons why we're here. We're, we're here to try to catch that kid or that young person at an early level and just teach them that there, there's another way you can go. Which brings us back to working out. When Bobby Williams, the X-Track and Field coach, and his wife started this church, they also started Love Up Fitness Camp. It's warm-ups and workouts and calorie-crushing calisthenics that kids in New Orleans East aren't able to get anywhere else. If you don't have access to certain things uh, in the community, for example, there, there aren't uh, many gyms. So a lot of times, I mean, the, the Bible says, the scripture says, people perish due to lack of knowledge. Kids came for the exercise. They stayed. A church here that's not just any church. In your gifts to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, add money. When people give to the Annie Armstrong offering, it helps a church with limited resources to be able to do more. Just plugging into the community and helping to meet needs and and again take take those lives to the next level. That's that's what, what I desire to do. Hope you plan on giving to your to your Andy Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, but before we begin, we got a little housekeeping to take care of, Kim. Uh, Sid's microphone went red, so we're going to change him from A to F. So go go ahead. While, while we got, I know it. It's just the way it goes. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm glad we have alternatives. So we're, we're ready, Ron.
Good morning, church. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for the day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for our house to come and just worship your name, Lord. Take the messages that are given, Lord, and let it apply in our lives. Let us try to live the way you want us to live, Lord. Lord, be with Brother Buckman as he comes today and gives the message. And Lord, just let us take that and apply it today, Lord, in our lives. Uh, this things we ask in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dickey. Uh, welcome. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Happy to have everybody with us. And, uh, different kind of start, but we're used to that. Uh, but thank you for being here with us this morning. In your worship, God, there's some announcements I want to call your attention to. Uh, one is about Vacation Bible School. You know, we didn't get to have it last year, but we're going to this year. You see an announcement about that in there. Also about Youth, youth uh, Summer Centrifuge Camp. Uh, you can make a, a donation to that to help some of the, the uh, kids pay their way. Uh, you just write on your envelope that it's uh, Youth Camp or Centrifuge, either one. You put that in with your regular offering in here, and uh, we will take care of where that goes. Thank you for doing that. And just, just one more. We have a, uh, one announcement that got combined with another one. That is about our Easter service. I can't seem to find it now, but uh, Easter on April the 4th, we will have one combined service in here. Uh, everybody, there won't be a contemporary service. Uh, you see the schedule there, Sunday school at 9, worship in here at 10 on Easter Sunday morning. But next Sunday, the 28th, uh, the ensemble will be singing our Easter musical during the morning service in here at 9 o'clock on that Sunday morning. Uh, there will still be two services that day, but if you want to be here for the Easter musical, it will be next Sunday at 9 o'clock in here. Uh, man, I think that takes care of all those things. Uh, we have special guests this morning. Brother Stan and Monica got to take a little vacation time this week, so he's, he's not preaching. Uh, but this morning, Brother Doug Buchanan. Uh, and now, where I'm from, in another place, we had some Buck Cannons, we had some Buchanans. And so if I said it wrong, uh, it was right somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> thank you for being here. Now, uh, his wife, Janet, uh, who teaches in Brighton, is here with him this morning. Uh, he's pastored several churches uh, here and around. Uh, they live in Arlington, as I said, and he is... Uh, associated with a ministry called Praying Pelicans Ministry. Be sure and ask him about that after church this, this morning. Uh, we're going to continue now with singing. Uh, uh, we're going to let our children's church go. Uh, Cindy's waiting for you up here by the organ. With me as we sing, beginning with There is a Fountain. Oh, oh, oh. 
the wondrous cross. Join with me as we sing. See from his head. See from his head. His hands, his feet. Sorrow and love, Lord, be That didn't go the way we planned, but it was fine. It's still a beautiful hymn. Go ahead, Ron, and start with that next song.
not ever be as good as they've been. Well, I've got good news for you. When heaven comes into view, one look and you'll know the best. Thank you, Brother Steve, and uh, I appreciate the privilege of being here this morning. I cannot say this about every place I've been, but I can remember very plainly the last time I was here with you. Looked in my notes, it was January of last year. One of the neatest things happened in the uh, church that I, I've ever seen or been a part of. Anybody remember what that was that day? Pastor Stan was in uh, Mexico for, for an ordination service. You and I participated in that and saw it on the big screen, and, and that was one of the coolest things that uh, I'd seen and, uh, and, and been a part of. And, but I'm thankful to be with you today. I'm asking you, if you would please take your Bibles, turn to the book of John, chapter 15, if you would please. John, chapter 15. There was a rivalry football game, college game, between University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University. That year, University of Oklahoma was having their usual good season. Oklahoma State was struggling. Last game of the year, Oklahoma State was playing. Their quarterback was Randy Johnson, who was the nephew of President LBJ. That game... Oklahoma State was behind by six points. There were two minutes left in the game. Coach for Oklahoma State called timeout. They had the ball. Got his team over and said, you know, two minutes left in the season. I'm going to put all my seniors in to play. And he looked at his quarterback, Randy Johnson, and said, I want you to call the plays. They got back on the field, and Randy Johnson said it was an emotional time. So I looked around at players I've been with for 40 years, and we were like brothers, and uh, said, I said, I could just see tears streaming down their eyes, and he said, it was an emotional time for all of us. And he said, and I, and I looked at the players, and I said to them, I said, we're going to run play number 13. Play number 13 was a trick play. Never had been run all year, but they ran at that time, and they scored a touchdown. Oklahoma State ended up winning the game. After the game was over, the coach called his quarterback, Randy Johnson, over and said to him, says, says I got to ask you, why did you call play 13? Randy Johnson said, said, coach, I was in the huddle with my teammates. The emotional times, the tears running down some of our faces. And he said, so I looked at one of, my, one of my teammates, and he was number eight. Looked at another teammate, and he was number seven. And he said, I added eight and seven together, and I called play 13. <laughs> Coach said to Randy Johnson, he said to him, he said, but Randy, 
8 plus 7 does not equal 13. And he said, yeah, coach, and if I was as smart as you, we would have lost the game, too. <laughs> now, now, sometimes, sometimes when uh, we, we, we look at the Bible, we just try to be too smart. Sometimes we try to be, uh, be, be, be too, you know, just try to outsmart what it says. Today is going to be so simple. Uh, in John chapter 15, it talks about vines and branches. I'm not too smart when it comes to vines. I don't have a lot of personal experience with vines and branches. I did read a little bit about it. I read, for example, that the largest vine branch in the world is in Hampton, England. It said that it's 200 feet long. It said some of its branches are two and three inches thick. It says it's over 1,000 years old. It said it's still bearing fruit. I read that when you plant a vine, it said you want to make sure you plant them 12 feet apart to give them plenty of room to grow. It says sometimes it can take 10, 12 more years before that vine begins to produce, produce fruit. Now I read that and, and I, I have a spiritual application of this. Number one is this. Number one, you and I never get too old to bear fruit. For example, vacation Bible school is coming up. Some of us say, I can't, no, you know, you never get too old to bear fruit and do what you can do. Second thing I realize when I read that is this. Producing fruit, bearing fruit, takes time. Now, that's about the limit of my personal experience and knowledge of vines and branches. But back in Jesus' day, when Jesus started talking about vines and branches, the people, they knew, they knew exactly what he was talking about. It was something they were, they were in touch with every day. For example, in the Old Testament, Vines and branches are mentioned 106 times. In the New Testament, vines and branches are mentioned 70 times. So when Jesus began talking about vines and branches, they knew exactly what he was talking about because it was something in their personal experience that they were a part of every day. So it's so simple in Bible days and for you and I today, when Jesus began in John chapter 15 and verse 1, when Jesus began by saying these words, he said, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Now, if you and I are going to understand what Jesus then says, we're going to have to have the proper perspective of what's taking place. We're going to have to realize the very foundation. Notice Jesus says, my father God is the vine dresser. Proper perspective is the vine dresser, he owns it all. The vine dresser, it all belongs to him. This morning, it's not your talent, it's God's talent. This morning, it's not your time, it's God's time. Hitting us right in the heart, it's not your and my treasure. It's God's treasure. Jesus is reminding us God is the vine dresser. God is the one who owns it all. It, it belongs to him. And so Jesus says this in verse, in verse 2 when he says, talks about pruning. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he says, he takes, he takes away. And you know what happens? That sap that was once flowing into, into that branch is no longer there and it's taken away. Now that sap begins to flow into another branch. Ever happened to you? Ever happened to anybody we know? Ever know anybody? They once had a talent. Didn't use it. God took it away. Ever know anybody may have happened to you or me who well, once had time? God says, okay, you're not going to use it. He takes it away. You ever know anybody that had the treasure or the testimony? Not going to use it? 
that energy that was flowing to that one person may have been flowing to you and me. God says, okay, we'll take it away. We give that time and that treasure and that talent and that testimony. Let's let it just flow to, to somebody else. But then Jesus continues talking about pruning when Jesus says this. He says, every branch in me that bears fruit, he says, he does prune. Now, pruning takes place for two reasons. Pruning takes place, number one, when, when, a, when a branch isn't bearing fruit, and also it takes place so that a branch can bear more fruit. You know what Jesus uses for pruning shares in your life and my life? Jesus uses Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God or to call it according to his purpose. God's constantly taking that verse and he's working on you and me. You know what the good is that God is working in your life and my life? God's goal of goodness in your life and my life is not so that you and I can, can have a good job. God's goodness is not so that you and I can have a good retirement. God's goodness in your life and my life is not so we can have a good portfolio and have our, have our finances all lined up. God's goodness in your life and my life is not so that, so that you and I can have good family relationships and we can just have, 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 a, have a good family get together. God's good that he ultimately works in your life and my life is to mold us into the image of and the lifestyle of Jesus. For we know that all things are working together. God's pruning us in order to mold us, shape us more like Jesus. The God that we love, the God that we desire to be purposed, to be purposed to. You know something else? Now think about this. The vine dresser is closest to the branch when? When he's pruning it. I believe just about everybody in this room this morning, and I don't say this without hesitation, I believe everybody that is worth their salt as Christians this morning can look back at times in their life and they can see where God did some pruning. And they can look back at those times in their life and they could say, that is the time of my life when God was closer to me than he's ever been before. And we would say this this morning, you know, God, I would not want to go through that again for anything. But I wouldn't take anything for it. Because that is when I was closer to you than I've ever been before. The vine dresser is never closer to the branch than when he's pruning it and when he's shaping it, preparing it for fruit in his life. Jesus goes on to say this in verse, in verse 5. I kind of think he just says it again for emphasis. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branch. Just kind of reminds us. And you know something, that vine and that branch, as it grows, there comes a time where that vine and that branch become, become so intermingled with one another, you can't tell where the vine ends and the branch begins. And you can't tell where the branch begins and the vine ends because they become so joined, joined together. And then Jesus adds this. He said, if you abide in me and my words uh, uh, abide in you, you will bear much fruit. No, notice two words there. Notice the word abide and the word bear. If you abide in me. That, that word abide, it, it means if you're connected, if you're connected to me. Once again, I don't have a lot of personal experience, vines and branches, but when Janet and I lived in Brighton, in our backyard, we had several apple trees. 
Once again, you, you plant them, and it took years for them to be producing apples. But here's something I never once saw happen. Didn't matter what the season of the year was, I could go out there and I could find branches from those apple trees laying on the ground. And not one time did I ever see a branch from the apple tree laying on the ground. And not one time did I ever see that branch bearing fruit. You know why? Because it wasn't connected. Jesus said, he who abides in me, he who is connected to me, the second word, he bears much fruit. Now, this is really outside of my personal experience. Notice he says he doesn't produce fruit. He says he bears fruit. And this is really outside my realm of life experiences. You mothers, you mothers, when you have a child, you, you don't produce that child. You bear that child. God is the one who produces the child. God forms it. God designs it. God fashions it. The mother's the one that bears it. That fruit that's taken place in your life, my life, you and I don't produce that fruit. God produces it in our life, and just like children are so different and have different personalities and different styles, God produces different personalities and different styles of fruit in your life and my life. He produces it, he shapes it, he forms it, he designs it, he grows it. But then Jesus said, you and I, we're the ones who bear it. So Jesus said, he who abides in me, he who is connected to me, doesn't produce fruit. But he bears fruit. And then Jesus adds this. Jesus says, for without me, you can do nothing. Now that, that brings this question this morning. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Let me ask us a question today. What would you want to do without God anyway? This morning, what is there that is so important in your life? What is there that just consumes your mind so much, and it's just a goal before you this much, that you would want to do it without God anyway? What is there that's so important that, that just, it's just in your mind, it's in your thoughts, that, that God would say, okay, you want it? You fill in the blank, that's your desire, that's your goal for you to have. He said, you can have it, it's yours. But you're going to have it without me. That's the direction you want to go, and that's a place you want to go, and, and that's what you want to do. You go ahead and go, but, but God says, you're going to go without me. What is there that would be that important? This morning in your life or my life. That we would want it without, without God. Great book by a lady named Hannah Short. The, the book's entitled the, uh, the God of, of All Comfort. Hannah Short writes about this in her life. She said, there's a time in my life I had a problem. So I'm not going to tell you what the problem is, because if I did, some of us would say that problem is nothing compared to mine, or some of us would say, boy, I've never had a problem like that. She just said, I had a problem in my life. She said, this problem was just consuming me. Couldn't get on top of it. It was just captivating my mind, my thoughts every day, and couldn't do anything with it, she said. But she said, there, I heard about this lady that's in our town, and she's supposed to be a very spiritual lady, wisdom, and so I called her and I asked her if we could meet. She said, I met with this lady, 
poured out my heart to her, told her about my problem, told her what I was going through, what I was experiencing, and, and um, said the lady just listened and listened, and after I finished, she said the lady, there was silence for a moment, and she said, then this lady said, but there is God. Hannah Short said that I thought for a moment, but I said to the lady, she said, I don't think you heard me. I don't think you heard about my problem. Nobody's ever had a problem like the problem I'm having right now. Went through it again with her. Poured out her heart. She finished. There's a moment of a silence. And this great spiritual lady said to me, said, but there is God. Hannah Short said, I went home, I was disappointed, I, I didn't get the words that I needed to hear, and so he said, I thought about that for several weeks. I called the lady again, said, can we get together, and told the lady again, just pour out her heart with her problem, and the lady said, but there's God. Pour it out, of there, but there's God, and that's all she said. Hannah Short went home. She said, I got to thinking about it. So I got to thinking about my problem, and I began thinking about God. And she said, you know, begin to think God's my redeemer. God's my rock. God is my, my fortress. God is my sustainer. God is my salvation. She said, I began to put my problem up against God she said I begin to realize there is God I wouldn't want this problem solved if God wasn't in it God I don't want to go I don't want to do if you're if you're not going not going with me Jesus says Without me, nothing is impossible. And then Jesus said, as this. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, meaning that if my words, think about that, if my words flow through you, listen to what he says. He says, you will ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. Powerful verse. And you and I, we marvel. When we see that verse lived out before us. I haven't seen it many times that I can point to and say that it's manifested itself. A couple of years ago, Janet and I were in Costa Rica on a mission trip. And uh, the lady that we were kind of the contact person there, her name was Sister Annabella. Sister Annabella, a little short Korean lady, barely five feet tall, but she ministered to the, uh, to the churches and the pastor around that, around that area. She was our contact person for the church that we worked with. And, and we, while we were there, we met a church from Jackson, Mississippi as a Methodist church. They brought their youth there, and they were coming for the week-long mission trip. Sister Annabella introduced us to the church, and this church from Jackson, they came, and it's mostly youth, and, and they were going to do construction. They got there the first day, and they did all the work they could do under their construction team, and they realized this job is bigger than us. We, we, we can't do any more. We went and told Sister Annabella. Sister Annabella said, let's pray about it. The next morning team was getting together after breakfast sister Annabella said to the team said I want to introduce y'all to somebody she introduced us to a pastor from Nicaragua she said last night I got a phone call from the pastor and she said that he was passing through going to be here for a few days and he was wondering if there was any work he could do anywhere wondering if there was some church he could help while he was there and she said, I told him about you guys from Jackson, Mississippi. You know what his trade was? The Nicaragua pastor, his trade was 
was a carpenter. Went with the team for a few days, finished up their construction work that they came to do there in Costa Rica. God took a Costa Rican lady, Sister Annabella, took a mission team from Jackson, Mississippi, took a pastor from Nicaragua passing through and took a church that had a need. God brought them together. Began with a prayer. Little Costa Rican lady, Sister Annabella. Annabella Miss Annabella, she told us um, sometime during that week. I don't remember who was in the group she was talking to, but she pointed her finger at us and she said, you American Christians, you carry too much garbage. You American Christians, you have many, too many things, too many resources to depend upon. Comes a time. All you can depend upon is God. Can't forget that, you Christians. You carry, carry too much baggage. Jesus then goes on to say then in, in verse 8. He said, by this, my Father is glorified. And I just picture by this, that, that's what makes God smile. By this, my Father is glorified, and you will be my disciple. You know what a disciple is? A disciple is a follower. A disciple is a pupil. A disciple is a student. A disciple is someone that says to God, says yes, before he even knows what the question is. And if I were to ask this morning, how many of us are Christians? I believe that if not all of us would raise our hand, all of us but just a few would raise our hand. I'm a Christian. If I were to ask the question, how many of us are disciples? I think that we would say, well, hey, let me think about that for a moment. I'm not too sure. Let me, let me think about that word, disciple. How do we stay connected? How do we begin that process of being a disciple? Three things. Number one, number one, we, we keep, keep God first. Matthew 6, says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. Reminded of that seeking God first, uh, this last week, and I think about this every time I, I, I go to this place or every time I, I drive by Chick-fil-A, I see the people lined up outside, and then I go to Hobby Lobby like I did with my wife this last week, stand in line for 15 or 20 minutes to, to pay. I think about this. Owner of Hobby Lobby, Steve Green, used to be open on Sundays. He was convicted by God that... Uh, God could do more with six days than he could with seven days. Since I was convicted of that, he said, so I decided to try it in Nebraska. He said, I closed down 18 of my stores to give it a test to see what would happen. Steve Green said this, God said to me, God said, you're not trusting me, you're testing me. Steve Green began the process of closing down all of his stores on Sunday took 18 months then for that to happen and he said then for three months he said he said it was it wasn't working out real well he said but then after about three months things began to turn God began to bless like he hadn't hadn't before you and I know God just doesn't bless financially but seeking God first has other opens up other ways for God to bless us. Number one, we're going to be connected. We seek God first. Number two, we seek God's word. Remember when Mary and Martha, Jesus said to 
of Mary and Martha said, said, Martha, look at Mary. Mary, she is seeking what is best. I think you would have said, Martha, what you're doing is good. It's what is needed. But Mary, she's seeking the best. Far too often you and I do what is good, but we're missing the best. Seek God first, seek God's word. Number three, seek God's heart. That means invest our life in things that are eternal. The older I get, the more, the more I realize how much I have invested in life that is temporary and how time is fleeing to invest in things that are going to be eternal. If we were to ask a question this morning, if we were to ask that, you know, how different states have uh, different mottos. For example, the, the Tennessee, Tennessee is known as the, the volunteer state. New York is known as the empire state. Florida is known as the sunshine state. Georgia is known as the what? Peach state. Listen to this. It goes back to the 1800s. Georgia used to make more peaches than anybody in the country. Today, California makes, produces five times more peaches than they do in Georgia. You know what? California's got the peaches, got the fruit, but Georgia's got the name. I wonder... I mean, in America, not just as a nation, but I'm talking about as individuals. How many got the name Christian? But where's the fruit that's being produced? It's one thing to have the name. It's another to have, have the fruit. I'm asking us just to bow our heads, close our eyes for a few moments if we would. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask us just to ask ourselves the question this morning. That question is, where's, where's the fruit in my life? Ask ourselves the question, what am I connected to? What am I holding on to? What's being produced in my life because of what, what I'm connected to? I'd say, first of all, this morning, to any group, person here that's not a Christian, has not had a personal relationship with Jesus, that means inviting Jesus Christ into our life and heart. Today is an opportunity to do so. Today is an opportunity to connect that something that's eternal, something that's going to last. For you and I as believers, What kind of baggage are we carrying today? What do we need to let go of? What do we need to trust God with? Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for being our God. Thank you for being patient with us. Just the fact that we're here shows, Father, that you are still working in our life. You want to produce fruit, not for ourselves, but for others. We just pray, Father, that you allow us to um, have hearts and wills open, sensitive to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Steve, what hymn will we sing? Only try. Only try. Let's please stand together, we would, while we sing. Come, every soul, love.